Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I've uh, enjoyed being in church with everybody. Enjoyed the songs and testimonies tonight. I'm uh, going to go to a few different places. Uh, we're going to be starting out in Matthew chapter 1. And we're just going to simply preach on the grace of God this evening. Matthew chapter 1, you know, uh, Sister Mary's testimony is a testimony of God's grace in her life. Tim reading about how that one day the church is going to be taken out. You know, we don't know when. I don't know when. Uh, some people believe it's going to be before the tribulation, some people in the middle, some people at the end. And, and the fact of the matter is none of us really know 100%, but what we all know 100% is that he is coming back. That's what we know for certain. That's the grace of God coming for his people. And so tonight that's what we want to look at, the grace of God. Before we get started, we'll open up with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come stand behind the sacred desk. Lord, we ask for your anointing, ask for your blessing, God, upon the word. Now, Lord, may it be a blessing to your people. May it draw the lost to come to know your son. For it's in his name we pray. And amen. If we was to uh, talk about what the Bible is all about, you know, as I've often said, there are... Um, there are many things that the Bible teaches us. It teaches us what morality is. It teaches us what is wrong. It teaches us what is right. It, honestly, it teaches us finances. If you look in the book of Proverbs, there are so many things. Prophecy is what we've talked about this evening. It teaches prophecy. But if we want to talk about what the main idea is, what the overarching theme of Scripture is, the overarching theme of Scripture is that God is redeeming man unto himself. It is the grace of God from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It is about God coming to man's rescue. Us as bankrupt sinners is what we are. Jesus said in the Gospels, He said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners under repentance. He says, those that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. And that was why that Christ came. And so the grace of God is there to save us. Now what is the grace of God? The theologians give it the definition of the unmerited favor of God towards man, and most certainly that definition fits. I think of grace as the picture of Christ hanging on the cross. But when we get right down to the nitty-gritty, grace is something that can't be fully explained, yeah. not with human words. I've used this illustration once before, but the song Amazing Grace is always a tearjerker. Always has been throughout the years. I remember at my uh, great-grandmother's funeral, I wasn't saved then, but they sung Amazing Grace, and you get that lump in your throat when they, when they sing it. Um, the day I got saved, and after then, the first time I sung Amazing Grace, there was a lump in my throat for a different reason. I understood Amazing Grace then. Yeah. I couldn't put it into words then, I still can't now. But it's the grace of God that comes to lost sinners. And we want to just look at it for a little while. You know, grace is throughout all of Scripture. As we said, it's from there, it's from Genesis, all the way through Revelation. When we get, though, to the New Testament, the veil, literally and figuratively, is both pulled away from grace, though. Yeah. So that we can see it a little more plainly. And it starts out right in the very first chapter of Matthew. In the genealogy of Christ, we see the grace of God. Because as we read through the genealogy, we read about people who are sinners just like you and me. Yeah. And you see, here's the thing about it. We will not have an appreciation of grace until we have a greater understanding of what we really are. Yeah. A lot of times we think of ourselves, you know, well, I'm, a, I'm a pretty good old boy or I'm a pretty good old girl, but the thing is, what are you good compared to? We are all sinners. We are all um, messed up. We are all twisted. And so let's just spend a few moments here and let's look at the grace of God displayed in the genealogy of Christ. It starts out in the very first uh, verse of the first chapter, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, it says. Who is this David? Well, we know the good attributes of David. And as I preach this tonight, don't think that I'm trying to knock anybody because I'm not. I think that every individual that we're going to talk about tonight is greater than I am. David, most certainly. David is without question my favorite person from the Old Testament. I, I love to hear about David. It's believed that David was kind of a small guy. I like him already based <laughs> off of that, right? <laughs> David was a guy, though, that stood before a giant when all the rest of the men of Israel backed away. They were scared. 
he said, is there not a cause? This giant that stood before and cursed Israel and cursed the God of the Israelites. We think about those things about David. We think about the man that wrote the 23rd Psalm. We think about all those things. But David also had that dark side of him that we know about. He was an adulterer and a murderer. Now someone might argue, well, David didn't really murder, but let's think about it. He told the captain to put Bathsheba's husband into the hottest battle right at the very front. His hand may not have been on the sword, but it was him that put Uriah right there. That's right. He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. And yet God's grace came to him. And one of the most important things we want to get through about this message tonight is that if you're lost, God can save you because that is what God is in the business of doing. He is in the business of saving people. The worst of us and the best of us, we all need saved. We all need washed in the blood. David was an adulterer and a murderer. But one of the beautiful things about this, if we look at this, God knew that David would be a repentant man. And the Bible tells us that when God chose David, he said, I am going to pick a king out for myself. A man after my own heart. Why is that important? It's important because of the omniscience of God. That is that God knows everything. He sees everything from beginning to end. There is nothing that is hid from his eyes. There is nothing that surprises him. And, David, and God said that about David, knowing David, what David would do. And the reason I bring that up is because as I call David an adulterer and a murderer, I don't think God has ever said about me that I'm a man after his own heart. Yet he said that about God, or said that about David. Yes. But yet in the midst of that, David was a sinner that needed saved. He goes on to say the son of Abraham. Abraham was in the genealogy of Christ. What was Abraham? Abraham was a man that was fearful and was a liar. You see, he had the, the faith to pack up and to leave the land that he stayed in and go to a place that he did not know where he was going, a place that God would show him afterwards. But when they got to Egypt, he said, you're going to have to be quiet speaking to his wife and tell them, tell them I'm your brother. Don't tell them I'm your husband because they might kill me. See, Abraham's a lot like we are a lot of times. He trusted God in the big things, but then he doubted God in the small things. God told him, I'm going to take you and I'm going to make a nation that is in, in, impossible to number. Yeah. It's going to be like the sands of the sea, going to be like the stars of the sky. And Abraham packed up and he left and he believed that. But he didn't trust God to get him through all the way. See, here's the thing about God. There's an old saying, where God guides, God provides. Yes, and he will take care of you along the way. Abraham was also the man that doubted the promise of God when his wife Sarah told him to go in unto Hagar, his handmaid, and they had a son named Ishmael, as you know. And Ishmael's descendants is why there is such problems in the Middle East today. If you go back and track through everything and go back to the Old Testament, it is from those descendants is why there is so much turmoil and trouble, or at least one of the reasons why there was so, so much trouble and turmoil in the Middle East today. Now one might say, well, Sarah told him to do that. Abraham's supposed to be the man in the family. Abraham knew that he wasn't supposed to do that. And the scripture doesn't record Abraham putting up much of a fight, does it? When she said, go in unto my handmaid, Agar. What's the next verse after that? So Abraham went in unto her handmaid, Hagar. Going on down through here, said Abraham beget Isaac. And Isaac beget Jacob. You want to talk about a family of fully dysfunctional people. Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau. You talk about someone that had family problems. These people had family problems. They were swindlers. They were liars. They were cheats. It, it was amazing. And yet God said, I am going to redeem these people. Now Esau ended up not being redeemed. Esau ended up uh, rebelling, as we know, and going the other way. Jacob ended up becoming a very godly man. 
But here's these people, and the reason we're bringing all of that out is because you and I, well, we're, we're not any better, are we? I mean, a lot of the times we clean ourselves up and we, we make ourselves look real good and smell real pretty for church. But the inside, we know what our struggles are. We know what our downfalls are. And when we begin to see that for what it really is, then we can begin to see what the grace of God really is. Because you see, as the old song says, and I know I quote this song a lot, but as I continue going on in my Christian walk, the line of this song becomes more true every year. In my hand, no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Probably like all of you, I go through life and I begin to think, well, you know, I'm doing pretty good in this Christian thing. I'm, I'm getting things down really good. And then before you know it, you trip over something and make a mess all over yourself. Yeah. We all do that. But it's when we begin to see the grace of God that we begin to get a security around us and an assurance around us that this thing isn't about me, that church isn't about me, that preaching isn't about me, that inviting people to church isn't about me. It's all about Him. And when it starts becoming all about Him, the preaching gets better, the singing gets better, the testimonies, they get more passion to them. You see, when the church gets a love for the grace of God and they understand the grace of God, they understand that their salvation has come fully, freely through and by the blood of Christ. That is a church that Satan hates because that church is a church that is praising God and giving him the praise that he so richly deserves. And so they continue on. It goes on down to the fifth verse. It's amazing that we're going to see this person in the genealogy of our Lord. But we must remember the grace of God. Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. Now, this is the New Testament word for the Old Testament name, Rahab. A prostitute yep. is in the Lord's genealogy. Yep. That is a beautiful thing when you stop and think about it. That is a picture of God's grace. Because you see, He can take lives that have been totally messed up by sin, by Satan, by this world, and God can make something of them. Yes. I don't care what, and I, I know I say this all the time, but I truly mean it. I don't care what a person has done in this world. God can forgive you. God can save you. God can change you. I don't care what your circumstances are right now. I don't care what kind of mess you've got yourself in and how you might think, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. I don't know how it is going to get better. I can tell you that the grace of God can make it better. The grace of God can do that for you. The world can't do it for you. The colleges can't do it for you. The psychiatrists can't do it for you. The self-help Books cannot do it for you, but when you come to Jesus, Jesus can do that for you. Amen. He took an old prostitute and put her in the bloodline of his son. Amen. That is a picture of the grace of God. <coughs> the next one to talk about before I move on to the next place I want to go, it says, and Jesse begat David. You know what? Jesse didn't think very much of his son David. When you go back and you look into Samuel, the Bible says that Samuel was sent to the house of Jesse to find God's king. And Jesse presented all of his sons, or at least what he said was all of his sons, before Samuel. And Samuel looked and he said, well, surely this one is, is it. He's tall, he's handsome, he looks the part. And God says, this is not my king. He went on to the next one who, again, was tall and handsome, fit, looked the part, and this is not my king. And God told Samuel, he says, don't look on the outward appearance. He says, I don't look on the outward appearance. I look on the inward appearance. Finally, Samuel said, is all of your sons here? Jesse said, well, there's, there's one more out there. There's one more out there, but he's, he's you don't want him. He's out there taking care of the sheep. Let me tell you something about the grace of God and what it can do for you. Everyone in the world might count you out as a loser. But when they brought in David, God says, that's my man right there. That is my man right there. 
Say, how and why is God able to do such things? How and why is God able to do such things? Because if we really get an understanding of what we are, and we know the holiness of God, we say, how and why? I think the answer to that is found in Isaiah chapter 52. And I think it's found in the, 50, or the 14th verse in Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah, looking down, was given a vision of the cross, was given a vision of the Lamb of God. And he said, as many were astonied or astonished, astonished at thee. And this is the picture of the Son of God on the cross of Calvary. His visage, and that word visage means appearance. His appearance was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. How is God able to take the mistakes? How is God able to take us even after we're saved and we've made a mess of things? And he says, I forgive you, my child. Let's get back on this course. How is God able to take the addict? How is God able to take the prostitute? How is God able to take your situation and my situation and say, I can do unbelievable things in your life? How is God able to do that? He is able to do that because of his son giving his life on the cross of Calvary. Because of this picture, the Bible says that Jesus' appearance, it was he was absolutely deformed there on the cross. And this deformity, this, this twisted mangle of flesh that was there left on the cross, this was not at the results of the Romans. I do not believe that this was because the Romans scourged him whatsoever. I do not think that was it. No, I think... The picture of grace is found in Matthew chapter 27 and the 45th verse. The Bible says this, I'm not going to be much longer. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. That last three hours there on the cross, there came a darkness over the land. And I think it was those three hours that the Son of Man became our very sin. The things that we have done, the things that we have thought, the things that we have said that perhaps no one else knows about, they became him. He bore them on his shoulders. And the punishment that was due to you and me, you see, here's why God can forgive us so freely. Here's why grace and how grace can change lives. Because the wrath and the punishment that we were due was poured out fully on the Son of God there on the cross. And I believe in my heart, even though I can't necessarily 100% prove it with the Scripture, I believe that as that last hour came to an end, and he cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he yielded up the ghost. I believe what the crowd saw was a completely different scene than before the darkness came over the land. Can you imagine what Jesus had to have went through in body, in soul, in mind for us to receive the free forgiveness of God? Listen, God doesn't put up with sin. He, doesn't put up, he does not accept it in any way, shape, or form. He will never do that because it is against His holy nature. And so in order to save us, the wrath that is stored up for sin had to go somewhere. And it will either go to a person, if they reject the Son of God, it will either go to them for eternity, or we accept what Christ did for us. And the full punishment that He bore upon Himself for those six hours there upon the cross, the last three being the most intense. That is the picture of grace. Him in our place. Him taking the full brunt. Can you imagine the Bible speaks to us? And I promise I'm getting ready to close. The Bible speaks to us of how God stores up his wrath for sin until one day it's full. The wrath that I deserved, the wrath that you deserved, he poured it out fully upon his son. I can't even begin to imagine what that was like. But that is grace. He took our place there willingly. You know, as I mentioned this 
not too long ago, as Sister Mildred comes to get us an invitation, the mission is not too long ago. Um, people ask, well, who was it that really killed Jesus? And they talk about who drove the nails in and this and that. Let me tell you something about those nails that was driven into him. Those nails did not hold him to the cross of Calvary. He stayed there for you and for me. He stayed there. The love that he has for us is beyond human understanding. I think about it and I dwell on it and I think about it and I dwell on it. People talk about, and I've heard this recently, people say, well, you know, isn't Christianity like every other religion? You're supposed to believe in God and love God and be good. Let me tell you something. Jesus did not come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men live. That is the gospel. That is the grace of God as we stand.